Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Sutherland. I'm with Canon Medical Research Europe. And today we're going to talk to you about creating a golden age for precision medicine. I'm really pleased to be joined by two renowned experts in the field, Professor Dame Anna Dominicek and Dr. Carol Clugston, both from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Now, to get into this topic, it's quite complicated and we'll try and avoid too much technical terminology. But to get into it, Anna's going to give us an introduction to talk through the area and to explain a little bit of the background. Anna, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Ken. We speak uh, not only on my behalf, but also Dr. Carol Claxton, and a lot of this work is Carol's uh, hard work at the University of Glasgow, where we both come from. And of course, what you see here is a wonderful view of Glasgow from um, the hill where the University of Glasgow stands, and it's our beautiful and favourite picture that starts presentations of many of my colleagues normally. So I think let's try to define precision medicine, or maybe we have now graduated to talk about precision healthcare. That is, you don't need the disease necessarily. You can also use the same principles for preventative care for a healthy population. And I think that's important development of the last few years. But when we think about population, at this stage we talk still about affected population by a condition or conditions. We then have a set of tools and they um, are many, many tools of classic medical activities such as history, clinical presentation, but also modern tools genetics, uh, genomics, molecular biomarkers. But in the center of this triangle, you see medical imaging. And imaging is the king in precision medicine. It's enormously important. And of course, what we're interested in is the therapeutic response or preventative response. And to do it well, we need new stratification of conditions, new stratification of disease, because the old names of various diseases come from purely descriptive and not mechanistic uh, disease history. And this is why under a name of cancer, for example, there are so many diseases, even breast cancer, several diseases under this heading. And that's why we need to become much more precise in the way we describe not individual patient, so it isn't personalized medicine, but groups of patients, large, sometimes multi-million stratas of disease. And that allows us to diagnose better, prognosticate, and most importantly, give the right treatment or the right preventative measures. But it also allows us to elucidate mechanisms of disease the new draggable targets, new treatments. But I think the most important single thing on this slide is that there isn't a group of professionals that can do it alone. That we need here researchers, health professionals, in our case, National Health Service, but also industry. And industry, life sciences industry, is terribly important part, maybe crucial part, to push precision medicine into this golden era from our subtitle. We also need patients. Patients or populations need to be ready and responsive to this different way of practicing medicine or healthcare. We talk sometimes about precision medicine ecosystem. The academic centers have been developing this for the last few years. And again, you see here, patients and clinicians, laboratories, health records, data, extremely important electronic health records, and imaging again, very important part of clinical laboratory. It isn't just sequencing of the DNA, however important it might be. It's also the phenotypes, the imaging, the history, family and medical history, all of this coming together and sharing knowledge across the world. We asked our stakeholders, mostly life sciences industry, but also others, what is the most important feature 
in devel developing precision medicine further in Scotland. And Scotland is very far advanced in precision medicine, as we're going to explain during this recording. And the majority of our stakeholders told us that supporting health service to adopt and mainstream precision medicine is extremely important. And the data were second. Integrating patient data sets was the second of important feature for our stakeholders. And we've taken this into our hearts and minds and have processed and progressed this idea of adoption and application of precision medicine in a real health system in a country of the right size, just about five millions in Scotland. And as I already said, it is that triple helix collaboration with academia, shown here as university, working closely with health system delivery, in our case NHS, but never forgetting that for dynamic innovation and development, we need life sciences industry to be truly involved in the process. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And this is the Living Laboratory for Precision Medicine, a very large grant um, which was awarded to the University of Glasgow and partners by UKRI Strengths in Places Fund. And you see here number of life science industry partners uh, making with the University and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board this living laboratory for precision medicine. And you see here some numbers. It accelerates productivity growth. It creates new jobs. It creates new economic uh, strengths and growth in wider area, not just in one place, but in entire Scotland. It supports the NHS through very significant avoidance of large expenditure that can be saved, that cannot happen because of precision medicine. But most importantly for me as a clinician, this improves patient outcomes. And you see here that up to 100,000 patients would benefit by 2028 from this initiative. So enabling adoption, enabling innovation, and enabling right environment is going to lead to a golden era of precision medicine. We have a number of use cases. We're not going to discuss them all. They listed here. I touch on two of those, the pharmacogenomics-based uh, medication management and the beautifully named Scottish Transcriptome Archive or STAR resource, just to give you a flavor. This is the real world implementation of precision medicine by producing the initial cohort analysis for pharmacogenomics. This was done for a typical population who is on multiple drugs, people who are age 65 plus, and we looked at 165,000 of such people in our own patient population in Greater Glasgow. Uh, you see that this is an expensive population as far as spend on drugs. And many, many uh, of these uh, individuals are on a very large number of medications, which leads to adverse reactions. Um, Average number of drugs was eight per individual. That's a lot of tablets. The most prevalent condition, the most common condition was high blood pressure and the most expensive diabetes. And this is not surprising. This is what how modern medicine looks normally. But most importantly, we showed that a very large percentage of these people uh, could have benefited from having a test, a pharmacogenomic simple test uh, on, a, uh, on a number of genes that are known to contribute to adverse reactions to drugs. And this would save enormous expenditure and patient suffering from adverse drug reactions. 
uh, we see here that doing this type of work would save 85 million pounds approximately over three years. And this is this healthcare cost avoidance that we mentioned before. So the work like that implemented in a real healthcare system for aging population would have given us enormous benefit if you do the test before you prescribe. And that's what we're going to implement first within the um, work of the living laboratory and then hopefully across entire Scotland and beyond. And the second example, second use case is uh, the archive resource which uses great stored clinical samples uh, from variety of disease and variety of disease affected tissues uh, within our health service. And this allows us to produce a messenger RNA biobank really already ready to look um, for new druggable tar targets, new drugs for the stratified groups of patients, or also redeployment of existing drugs for new groups of patients, uh, the reutilization of what we already know. Um, and this is a unique set of 30,000 samples that could change treatment of number of diseases from cancers through cardiovascular to inflammatory disorders across the board of uh, medical applications. At the same time, of course, we have been living through the pandemic, and this is a picture of the Lighthouse Laboratory in Glasgow that sits in the very centre of the living laboratory in the same uh, university campus, university hospital campus. And this lighthouse laboratory that came to being in March 2020 uh, to test for COVID uh, using PCR technology is an exemplar of Triple Helix partnership developed previously through the living laboratory concept. It is part of the larger network of laboratories across the UK. Uh, it operates day and night and Christmas and New Year and all the time. It amazingly um, did already more than 25 million samples since 21st of April 2020. It has a capacity that is now above 90,000 samples per day, which is not something we've known prior to this pandemic in any laboratories in our country or internationally. It employs hundreds of young people who have learned uh, to be diagnosticians of the future. It was established with support of small medium enterprise companies that are named here. Uh, and it is a living example that working with life sciences industry brings innovation in an immediate fashion as it was necessary for the pandemic. Um, we've worked extremely hard to upskill um, and to retrain staff to be ready for this enormous work. And we believe that this will be big legacy for UK diagnostics, for precision medicine, for living laboratory and wider um, implementing that triple helix innovation across the UK and further afield. So we believe that Lighthouse Laboratories Network, and there are 10 of those across the UK, could save more lives that the pandemic took if we deployed this enormous capability for legacy work in the future. And again, the most important is Triple Helix. Uh, clearly, at the moment, with Omicron all over the world, we still make significant contribution to the pandemic every day and night. 
But long term strategic intent is to make Scotland and UK the leading edge high throughput diagnostic centre globally. And you see number of examples here. But most important, I believe, is the public private partnership, the commercial propositions with life sciences industry, which bring that push for innovation that won't stop when this pandemic luckily finishes, which will continue long into the future, making us implementing precision medicine better than we would have done had the pandemic never happened. So in summary, uh, this is a great combination of high throughput diagnostics, working with life sciences industry, consumer centering primary care, where digital activity and doing things at the high street would be first, not necessarily in the specialist center um, in early stages of any activity. Uh, preventative mass screening, polygenic risk scores, early detecting disease much, much earlier than we've ever done before. And of course, this personalized treatments and interventions, not for individual, but for large groups, stratas of patients or population to prevent and treat better than we've ever done before. 